So before we get too deep, we've already kind of talked about it. Can someone tell me the difference between an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis? Does anyone know? Anaphylaxis affects two or more body systems. Multiple body systems, right. So we're not just dealing with an isolated case like an allergic reaction. We're talking anaphylaxis. We're talking multiple systems, right? So that's why the, the trouble really starts showing up, especially when we include airway in one of those systems. So EMTs often respond to calls involving allergic reactions. Yep, that's going to happen. Okay, you guys will be dispatched out to allergic reactions. You'll see them in all shapes, forms, manners, different locations. In my experience, I did not have a whole lot of the traditional, let's meet them in a park, they got stung by a bee. Um, in my experience, most of my allergic reactions actually got pulled out of clinics. Uh, people went to the doctor thinking I have an allergic reaction. Doctor gives them a shot of Epi, some Benadryl, and then they call us to take them to the hospital. Um, so a lot of times the nice thing of that is, is that if medications have already been given, we're kind of, we got time, right? We're already working against whatever's going on. That said, you will from time to time show up to people's homes, right? They, uh, the last one, like Ace, you were saying with that Jeremy fella, um, gal ate a peanut butter, or eat a, a protein bar that had peanuts in it, didn't know it had peanuts in it, because apparently she can't read the label that says has peanuts in big letters, but I digress. Okay, so you will see it from time to time. So allergy-related emergencies can involve acute airway obstruction and cardiovascular collapse. Remember that anaphylaxis does progress into a type of shock, right? Anaphylactic shock. So with shock in general, that all leads to cardiovascular collapse. Okay, now remember with anaphylaxis, this is gonna be part of the distribution or uh, distributive shock, right? So this is where we start worrying about that massive vasodilation caused by whatever's causing the, the allergic reaction, okay? So you must also be able to treat life-threatening complications and then distinguish between the body's usual response to an allergen and an allergic reaction. Now, a lot of the times when people are allergic to things, they're well aware that they're allergic to things, okay? Now, we have to have the understanding of, we gotta ask good questions. If we ask them, you know, have you ever had an, or excuse me, a reaction like this before? And they say yes, then we can start asking severity. Have you ever gone to the ICU? Have you been intubated for this, right? We wanna know what the severity looks like because we wanna know how much time we have. Right, if they have a history of, oh yeah, I got stung by a bee and I got sent to the ICU and I was on a vent for a week and a half, we know the next bee sting is gonna be worse, right? Every, every time you get an allergic reaction, the next one builds on the, on the last one, okay? And then immunology, that's the study of the body's immune system, pretty complex, pretty deep, okay? And then there's five categories of stimuli that may provoke an allergic reaction and we will get through those today, okay? So a little AMP review. So the immune system protects the body from foreign substances and organisms. When a foreign substance invades the body, the body initiates a series of responses to inactivate the invader, to kill the invader, right? So basically when we start talking about an allergic reaction, we're talking about an overdramatic reaction of the body's immune system. For whatever reason, that bo your body does not like whatever that substance is. Body says, you want peanuts? Well, I don't like peanuts. I'm going to kill you now, right? Like that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. So I have the understanding, right? As the body starts entering shock and it starts trying to fix itself, it oftentimes ends up doing a little bit more damage, right? If we're talking about especially like backtracking to hypovolemic shock, if we're bleeding and our heart rate increases, we're just shooting more blood out of our body faster, right? Uh, and we'll talk about what this, this chain looks like. This is going to include things that are elements in the blood that we have not really talked about because it's stuff that's in the immune system, but more so it's stuff at a deeper cellular level that you don't really need to know the whole ins and outs of. Your guys' job is more so can we respond and identify an allergic reaction and then fix the problem. So for the patho, an allergic reaction is an exaggerated immune response to any substance, right? Just whatever that body does not like, it is an exaggerated over response, okay? Now, it's not caused directly by an outside stimulus, but an outside stimulus helps, okay? So what they mean by that is that they're predisposed to an allergy. They're predisposed to some sort of allergen, right? So that's already going on inside them. It's not until that they get that, um, 
stimulus that they start having the reaction, right? So even though, yes, the outside stimulus is what's causing the allergic reaction, what's really causing the allergic reaction is the fact that they are um, so, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, they're just so overreactive, right? Their, their immune system is so overreactive. So caused by the body's immune system releases chemicals to combat stimulus, and this includes histamines and leukotrienes. I would remember those two words if I were you. And then we've got a diagram coming up, which I can show you, or I'll explain kind of what those, how that looks, okay? Now, some patients may not know what is causing their reaction, so you're gonna have to do some digging, okay? Can we recognize the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, right? Now, commonly, when we think anaphylaxis, we think allergic reaction, we think maybe that airway swelling up, okay? Has anyone ever had an allergic reaction? Not anaphylaxis, but just allergic reaction to something. What happened to your skin? You got hives, right? Well, hives, integumentary system, that's one system. So if we start talking with tongue swelling or lip swelling, that's airway involvement. We've hit two systems, right? We are now in anaphylaxis. Okay, so one of the first few things you want to do is you want to look at their chest, right? Pull their shirt down, look at their chest, raise their shirt up, look at their stomach. Right, make sure you're not missing the hives because that can be a very clear cut identifier, okay? Um, and then allergic reaction may be mild and local or severe and systemic. So the mild local ones are not typically the ones we're worried about, right? It's like if you're allergic to metal, you're wearing a belt that rubs on your stomach, you get a little rash, it goes away, right? We're not super worried about that. We're worried about the systemic anaphylaxis. Now, back to the first bullet. Like I said, in my experience, a lot of my allergic reaction calls came out of clinics, came from people's homes. I have had a couple where one, one was a child where he was out uh, in the village by that play area in the village there. And he was allergic to eggs. Mom and, mom and I think his aunt or mom and mom's friend went to Chick-fil-A, got a Cobb salad, had eggs on it, but they asked him for no eggs because they didn't want to cross contaminate. Well, whoever made the salad touched the eggs, put them on, took them off, touched the kid's sandwich, went into anaphylaxis. Okay, sometimes you're gonna have to do some digging. I've heard a story about a um, couple of medics that I know. One of them, well, they're no longer with Ada County, one's with Nampa Fire and one's with uh, Flight. But both of them, the one who's at Nampa Fire, I, I really like that guy. He's, uh, he does some deep digging and he gets kind of nerdy about weird stuff. They had an allergic reaction call that they had managed, but he wanted to absolutely figure out what was going on. Gal was allergic to tomatoes. Or no, thought they were, he, she was allergic to tomatoes. Turns out she was allergic to latex. And when they were preparing her food, they were using latex gloves. Okay, so it's pretty small stuff. Um, on a side note, I just saw an interesting video about people who are allergic to latex are also allergic to certain vegetables. I can't remember, but I think tomatoes is actually on that list because there's some sort of similar chemical component to it. Okay, so I'll talk about the words and then I'll explain the picture a little bit. So an anaphylaxis, or anaphylaxis is an extreme life-threatening allergic reaction involving multiple organ systems and then can rapidly result in shock and death. And remember shock, the end result of shock is cardiovascular collapse, which it's hard to be alive with cardiovascular collapse. Okay, so we have these little cells floating around in here called mast cells, okay? Now mast cells kind of float through the bloodstream. This is one of those components in the blood. Basically what happens when we have an allergic reaction, remember they're predisposed to be allergic to something, right? Whatever that is. So for this example, this person's allergic to bees. So their mast cells, because they're part of the immune system, have these very specific uh, receptor sites. So these little yellow Y looking deals. Okay, they're very specific receptor sites. That cell, those cells are prepped to handle a bee sting. Right, the, the allergen that they are ready to react to is a bee sting in this example. So those receptor sites are made specifically for that, right? They got one experience as a child, maybe they got stung by a bee, the body didn't like it. They're like, well, we're never gonna let that happen again. So we're prepping. Now, what really happens though, is that that mast cell is ready. They get stung by the bee, the bee pushes the venom. Those, that mast cell is going to, basically the receptor site is gonna receive one of those antigens from the bee and it's gonna massively release histamine and leukotrienes, okay? More specifically, it releases something called a basophil and then that pops, but end, end result is still histamine, 
leukotrienes, okay? And so when we get these histamine releases, these mass histamine releases, these mass leukotriene releases, that's what's causing anaphylaxis, okay? Now, that's a little bit deeper of an explanation than you really need to know. Just understand the body's cells are predisposed to the allergen. When they react with whatever the allergen is, the allergen in this example being bee venom, right, or wasp venom, um, they're gonna release the histamine and leukotrienes, therefore causing an allergic reaction, okay? Now, that's where we also have the idea of multiple bee stings start playing a role, right? If you have, get stung by multiple bees, the faster this reaction is going to happen because you have more of that toxin floating through the body. Okay? So, yeah. So if you get stung by a bee but you're not allergic to bees, are those two chemicals still getting released? No. We don't, uh, your, your mast cells don't have that receptor built in. It. Remember, it's not the stimulus that causes allergic reaction. It's our body prepped for an allergic reaction. Yeah. So, well, what happens when we have that massive histamine leukotriene release? We start involving other uh, systems, right? So the lungs will begin to bronchospasm. They start to almost have like an asthmatic response, right? They tighten up in the bronchi, and then they're going to have vasoconstriction in the lungs. Okay, so we have less blood returning to the lungs. And on top of that, the bronchi are closing up, right? So our air in and out is getting weakened. Our perfusion line through our lungs is getting weakened, okay? Then from there, if we're moving to the heart, we have decreased cardiac output, okay? So the heart is not beating as hard, right? If we, we can calculate the, the CO, what's the um, equation for, for CO, cardiac output? Someone tell me. Yeah, stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume, once again, being the amount of blood per heart beat, right? So their output in general is going to start going down, and that can be either the, uh, the that can either be the heart rate going down, or that can be the uh, prefill of the heart going down. And then on top of that, we have decreased coronary flow, right? We start having vasoconstriction around the heart a little bit, so there's going to be less blood returning to the heart. Now, in the skin is where we start to see more problems. Um, trivia question, what's the biggest organ in our body? Our skin, right? So, if you look under the, the vasculature there, first thing it says is vasodilation, right? So, if the skin is our biggest organ, it has one of the biggest amounts of, of perfusion, right? The, or the need for blood is highest there. So, if we have that vasodilation, we're going to start dropping blood pressures, okay? And then on top of it, you start having what we call leakiness. Okay, so that, that cell wall permeability, remember permeable is the ability of something to go through something, it increases. Okay, so they start pushing fluid through vasculature into surrounding tissues. And if we think about what swelling is, right? Swelling is fluid being pushed off from surrounding tissues, trying to get blood to an injury site for healing purposes. It's kind of the opposite, but this time we're running into blood pressure drops, okay? Well, it's shock. We know their cardiac output goes down. Their cardiac demand is gonna be high, but if a blood pressure goes down in shock, what does our heart do? What does our heart rate do? It goes up, right? Well, if we have a high cell demand that we can't meet, and now we're, at, we're asking the heart to do more, do you see how cardiovascular collapse starts to fall into the equation there? And then the skin, you'll see hives being the big one, Okay, hives in the medical world, the term we use is urticaria, and I'll bring it up so you guys can spell it and see it. But urticaria is going to be what we see with, that's the hives. You also might see what's called uh, pruritus, okay, pruritus. Pruritus is basically like little bumpies, right? They're, they're not like big, if you guys have seen hives or had hives, they're a big skin irritation. Pruritus is a bunch of small little dots. Like, did you ever have that kid in your elementary or middle school who was allergic to graphite, so they'd poke themselves a whole bunch and they'd get all those little red dots all over their arm? That's kind of what it looks like. No, I'm not allergic to graphite because I'm a man. <laughs> well, I have a piece of my arm from my sister stabbed me once upon a time, but never went away. I'm not allergic. And then edema, right? We're going to start having that swelling, that massive swelling. And if we start talking about what's called angioedema, a-N-G-I-O edema, that's when we're talking specifically about swelling around the face. Okay, so lips, tongue, cheeks, 
okay? Any questions on this so far? I know it's kind of a complex one, but end of the day, just remember you guys need to know what our treatment is and how to identify this, okay? So three common signs, urticaria, like I was saying. So hives, small areas of generalized itching or burning that appear as multiple small raised areas on the skin, okay? So do you guys remember what it's called when we pinch the finger and then the finger turns white? What's that word? It starts with a B. No, not quite. It's kind of like branching, but with an L. Blanching. Blanching, yeah. I got you mostly there. But yeah, blanching, right? Blanching is when it starts turning white. So if we look at these hives, right, there's a few that are starting to blanch, okay? Well, if we're just kind of putting pieces together, what do you think that means for the circulation to those specific spots? It's probably not great, right? It's where we're starting to become, wor we become worried about the systemic circulation. We gotta start paying attention. These are signs, right? Perfusion's gonna start taking a hit with all the blanching, depending on how much of that blanching they show. Now, a lot of times, or oftentimes, these hives show up all over the place. You can have very specific to like location. So if someone gets stung in the leg, they have hives on their leg. In my experience, when I've seen it, I've seen it on their chest, okay? Especially like true anaphylaxis, you start seeing it in on their chest. The next one, this angioedema. So this is a pretty intense case of angioedema. Okay, so areas of localized swelling, typically angioedema is around the face. Okay, now if we look at that picture, that gal's obviously got some angioedema going on. How do you think that airway is doing? Not great, right? This is why with anaphylaxis, you guys have to be kind of quick on the draw, right? We show up, you guys can only give epi. Is epi gonna fix anaphylaxis? No, they need Benadryl or Famotidine. They need H1, H2 blockers, histamine blockers, okay? So for you guys, this is where maybe getting ALS on the horn is pretty important, right? If you're far away, you've got a little ways before you get to the hospital, this is where meeting up with ALS is gonna be great because if this, this lady's airway is gonna continue to get worse and worse, if we're gonna tube her, we wanna tube her before her tongue's that big, right? We wanna at least have a fighting chance at getting an airway established, okay? And then wheezing. Remember wheezing, the sound of asthma, but if we think about asthma as a term, right, the word bronchospasm also means basically asthma. That's all asthma is, is bronchospasming. So anaphylaxis causes bronchospasming. So you're gonna hear expiratory wheezes, okay? And if it's really bad through that airway, what other sound do you think we're gonna hear? If we're already hearing wheezes. Strider, right? That upper airway swelling sound, right? We're gonna hear that sing-songy strider coming from the throat. Very good. Okay, so you might also note strider on inspiration due to upper airway narrowing. Uh, hypotension due to vasodilation and increased capillary permeability, right? They're gonna start swelling up like a balloon. They're gonna start having low blood pressure because a lot of their fluids are being shifted from vasculature to tissues. Has anyone in here ever seen that movie Hitch? Right? You know, has anyone ever seen that? Am I crazy? The Will Smith movie? Wow. Nobody's going to admit to it. It's fine. I'll do it. Uh, well, there's a scene where he eats shellfish and his whole face starts to swell up, right? And so some people, when they start to swell up, it's not just their mouth. It's like their ears around their eyes, um, even just locally. Okay. And then another thing, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps. So let me ask you this. If we show up, we're worried about anaphylaxis, we dispatch to an allergic reaction. And all we see is upper airway involvement. Do we call that anaphylaxis? What? Not yet, why not? Correct, we have not found another system, so we're gonna have to, that might be an allergic reaction affecting the airway. We still gotta get involved, but I wouldn't call that anaphylaxis. Now, same situation, we show up, they have some airway, and as we interview them, they're like, yeah, I've had diarrhea for the last hour. Would you call that anaphylaxis? Would you call that two systems? Yeah, right, that would technically be anaphylaxis. GI involvement, that's an organ system. So diarrhea, vomiting, that's another symptom you can see, okay? Now, what if we can even move this further? What if they have hives, nausea, vomiting? Would we call that anaphylaxis? Yeah, still two systems, right? So it's just multiple system involvement. It doesn't have to be airway. 
That said, most commonly, you'll see airway repercussions. Okay, but just keep that in mind. It's not gonna be anaphylaxis just because their airway is tightening up. Okay, it could be just a pretty severe allergic reaction. It's not anaphylaxis till there's multiple systems. So, common allergies. Food may take more than 30 minutes to appear with the very common ones being shellfish and nuts. Why do you think it takes 30 minutes? Digestion, Digestion right? That food's gotta break down. So a lot of times they'll eat it and they're gonna feel okay for a little while and then they're gonna notice, right? So the one example I was telling you about with that gal who ate the protein bar, she called us about five to 10 minutes after she, she ate it because she reread the wrapper and said it's got peanuts in it, okay? So she, we were a little early to that, which is perfect. We wanna show up early so we can get them epi early, okay? Just keep that in mind. Uh, fun facts is that shellfish for a long time was actually a uh, relative contraindication to fentanyl administration for pain because the way they used to derive fentanyl for us to use medication wise uh, was from shellfish. So if you had a shellfish allergy, you ran the risk of an allergic reaction with fentanyl. Um, you guys will find some foods do have similar chemical makeup to uh, some medications, so they're not allowed to take some of them, okay? Antibiotics, that's a pretty common one too. The big one being penicillin. You will see most old people become allergic to penicillin. It's a very common allergy. And then NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's gonna be like your over-the-counters, right? Your Aleve, your ibuprofen, your Advil, that kind of thing. Now antibiotics, you're gonna see quite a bit. Like I was saying, reason being with penicillin is that with, when penicillin came out, it was a, a wonder drug. We used it for everything, right? Fixed all the problems. Well, the problem is, is we started overusing it for people who didn't necessarily need it. So the body started building up a response, a, an immune response to it. Okay. For those of you who did not know, penicillin is a bacteria or is a mold. Okay. That's how it was found. It was an accident. Guy was working on something else. Was working on different uh, strains to kill bacteria. Notice he had this random mold growing. That mold where it was growing had no bacterial chains around it that he could see in his petri dishes. So he grew it. Turns out that turned into penicillin. Fun facts. I'm allergic to that. Huh? I am allergic to that. Yeah? Welcome to being an old person, Ace. <laughs> a little early. Okay, so medications. Now, remember, we give meds in different routes, and depending on our route is going to dictate how quickly that hits them, right? So if a medication is injected, the reaction may be immediate and severe. Why? To the Quicker to the bloodstream. Exactly. Versus oral medications may take 30 minutes to appear, but can also be very severe, right? So they can still be severe. It's just the time that it takes for them to show up. Okay, so oral medications, much like food, take about 30 minutes or so to digest. So once they fully digest, that's when we're gonna start seeing the reaction. Now, for you guys, if we, before we give any medication, what question do you think we gotta ask? Yeah, any allergies, right? Because we don't wanna give them a medication that they're allergic to. We don't wanna make things worse for them, okay? And that's why, especially when we start talking about, or if you guys advance your scope to IV medications, it's more important, right? Especially knowing that we can have an instantaneous reaction to this medication rather than it taking a little time. Uh, plants, dust, pollen, other plants, ragweed, ryegrass, maple, oak, just examples. Lots of plants out there, lots of people out there, lots of allergies out there. So people are allergic to all sorts of stuff. Okay, but plants are in that list. Chemicals is another one. Um, I'll kind of go in on this one in a second. So makeup, soap, hair dye. And nowadays, latex. Latex, similar to penicillin, a lot of usage when we discovered it, right? And eventually people start building immune responses to it, which is why none of the gloves that we, you will see or use when you're in the field or even in a hospital are made of latex. They're all made of nitrile, okay? So the fun days of blowing up a glove like a balloon are gone, let me tell you. Now, another thing with chemicals, this is where we can start asking creative questions, right? We gotta find what they're allergic to. Not on that list, what's another one you think is pretty common that people use all the time when they bathe? Not soap. None of you guys wash your hair, do you? Gross people. Shampoos, right? I like how you all see soap and you're like, that's the list, I don't know. Yeah, yeah shampoo. People are allergic to shampoos all the time. 
or laundry detergent. That's another really common one. There's a guy out of the prison, they had to swap the detergent three times because he kept having allergic reactions on the next one they brought in, okay? So you can do some deeper digging, right? It's not always gonna be, well, what did you eat? What medicine did you take, right? What have you been around? What have you eaten? What have you consumed? Have you had any changes in you know, shampoo, soap, any changes in uh, fabric softener? laundry detergent, right? These are questions we can start asking because people can have a broad set of allergies, okay? Um, has anyone ever had allergy testing in here? Okay, so how they test for allergies basically is they take a vial, a bunch of vials, and they dip a needle in there, and then they'll scratch your bare back with it. They're not gonna like jab and you know cut you, but they're gonna scratch you with it. And if you're allergic to it, you're gonna have a reaction. Um, I've heard lots of stories about it not being fun, but just that should be kind of an explanation of there are lots of things out there. Okay, if you guys look up these tests, you'll see 40, 30 to 40 different little scratch marks that they're trying a bunch of different stuff. Okay. Uh, last one, pretty common, insect bites and stings. So remember, envenomation is the process of it, the insect injecting its venom. Right? Envenomation is that we are receiving the venom from some sort of insect or bug. Okay. Now, the reaction can be localized or maybe severe and systemic, right? Just depends on the person. Do I have anyone in here who's allergic to mosquito bites? My wife is allergic to mosquito bites. She gets a mosquito bite and it balloons up like bigger than a 50 cent coin or a 50 cent piece. Um, so that would be more of a localized reaction, right? Versus if so, you know, getting stung by a bee, having that full blown anaphylaxis, hives, airway swelling, maybe nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Okay, so approximately 2 million people, rather 2 million Americans, are allergic to the venoms of bees, wasps, and hornets. Okay, 62 deaths a year attributed to allergic reactions. And then in about half of these deaths, the victim had never experienced a reaction to prior stings. You can have anaphylactic reactions to things you've never been exposed to before. There is a genetic component to this as well. If you have a family member who is allergic to nuts, there's a chance your child's allergic to nuts, okay? Um, which is kind of scary, right? I have a friend who, when she gave her daughter peanut butter for the first time, she actually gave her peanut butter sitting in the ER parking lot. She was so, so nervous about it. Now that kid, you can't get him out of peanut butter. But in the moment, right, that's, it's a scary thing, especially knowing that kids and people can react to things even though they've never been exposed before. Okay, a lot of the time they have been exposed, but that's just a risk, right? Especially with people being allergic to so many things. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's a whole lot of stuff out in this world, right? Just saying. So the stinging organ of an insect or of most insects is a small hollow spine projecting from the abdomen. So if it is an insect that leaves its stinger behind, how do we remove it? Yeah, we scrape it with like a card, right? Something hard with a rigid edge, okay? We don't wanna use tweezers, why? What happens if we use tweezers? Squeeze all the rest of the toxins. Yeah, we're squeezing the rest of that venom into the body and we're just gonna make the reaction that much worse, okay? So we show up on scene anaphylaxis, you've got two thoughts you need to have in your head pretty quick, right? After you've identified, obviously. You show up, that looks like anaphylaxis, let's get epi, let's find a stinger, okay? Can we slow down this reaction with epi and then can we find the cause and remove that so we know it's not gonna get worse, okay? So honeybees cannot withdraw their stinger. If a honeybee stings you, they die. Um, I've seen this video a couple of times. Basically they sting you and then as they like walk away from you, all of their guts get pulled out with it. Um, kind of crazy. Versus wasps and hornets. They can sting multiple times. Little bastards, right? They can get you quite a bit. Not only that, they bite too. So not every pain you're feeling from a wasp is a sting, okay? Sometimes they're biting you. Fun times, yeah, not a big fan. Um, ants, especially fire ants, they're known to strike repeatedly. Is anyone, you guys are wildland people, anyone tangle with fire ants yet? I've had a lot of ants. No. Oh. Wait, what? Wait, I set up my fucking, well, excuse me. You're good. I, uh, um, sleeping bag, bright line in, I, mm. <laughs> I noticed it pretty quick. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. 
So fire ants, they're also known to have fairly painful bites. Um, and remember, they are a small enough insect that's colony insect, so you're not dealing with just one ant at a time, hardly ever. Okay, so if they're allergic to things like fire ants and they sit in a fire ant hill, they're gonna get, they're gonna get bit multiple times, right? So that's just more and more venom being pushed into the body. All right, so sudden signs and symptoms. So this is kind of a, a good breakdown for you. That guy looks like a hive, right? It is a hive, but do we see multiple hives or just one? If there's just one hive, we call it a wheel. A wheel, if you will. So signs and symptoms, right, of insect stings, sudden pain, swelling, maybe localized heat. Remember, blood does a couple of interesting things for our body, gives us temperature, gives us color. So if we have an area that is filling and swelling, right, there's lots of blood and lots of fluid going to that area, it's gonna be a different temperature. It's gonna be warmer. Okay, to the same point, anytime you have swelling, it'll be warmer. So next time you're running, your knee starts bugging you, when you get back, feel both knees at the same time. The one that's bugging you more often than not is warmer. Uh, urticaria, right, we might see the hives, we might see redness in light-skinned individuals. What do we call it when someone's skin gets red? What? Rosation? Nope. Starts with an F, pretty common. When you get embarrassed and you feel all that blood running to your face, what's that called? Flushed, yeah, you get flushed, right? And then itching and a wheel, right? So you can either have urticaria, which is widespread or more, more widespread hives, or you can have a singular hive, that's a wheel. Okay, so urticaria is multiple individuals a wheel. So severe anaphylaxis, right? We're moving into, we can identify this quickly, this allergic reaction has progressed. Okay, so the signs, symptoms we are gonna see. Strider, bronchospasm and wheezing, Okay, chest tightness and coughing. Chest tightness is more of a symptom, right? They're gonna, that's not the one we can see, but you guys have probably all had it when you, you run hard enough and you go to take that first big breath and your rib cage is glued together, right? It doesn't expand. It's gonna be basically what it feels like. Don't be surprised that they start coughing, especially as they start having that throat irritation, okay? Uh, difficulty breathing, anxiety, GI complaints, and hypotension. Now remember anxiety, that's gonna be a big one. These people are gonna be freaking out, okay? And some people, a lot of times if they don't know they're allergic to something, it kind of hits them that much harder. Um, one of the worst anaphylaxis patients I ever saw, took her out of a clinic downtown, never had a dog, wanted a dog so bad, adopted it, found out pretty quickly she's anaphylactically allergic to dogs. She cried the entire way to the hospital, mostly because she just bought this dog and wanted a dog. I don't know what to tell you, right? At the end of the day, that's the dog's gonna kill you. Um, but just remember, there's gonna be an anxiety component. So this might be one of those things we have that human moment, right? We engage with them, we try to make them as comfortable as we can, even if that's just through em empathy and making them comfortable. Now, patients may occasionally experience respiratory failure, right? Makes sense. Remember, they're going into anaphylactic shock. Now in adults, more often than not, if we're talking that progression into cardiac arrest, usually with adults, the heart fails, then the lungs go. This is one of the few times it kind of flip-flops, right? Depending on the severity of the uh, attack, the allergic reaction there. Okay, so if it's a severe one, their airway shuts down. If they're not bringing air in, their heart's still beating, that heart's gonna stop. Remember, cellular demand, if we can't provide that oxygen, the cells are gonna die. Okay, so if untreated anaphylactic reactions can proceed rapidly to death, and then more, more than two thirds of patients who die of anaphylaxis do so within the first 30 minutes. Okay, time is of the essence with these, to the point you're gonna have to be very, very fast. Okay, um, I think, did I, did I ever tell you guys about the faker, the anaphylactic faker? Okay, so there's a gal, this was my last like anaphylaxis call even though it wasn't anaphylaxis. But there's a gal, she's basically known to the emergency system around here. She has Munchausen's. Does anyone know what Munchausen's is? Or anyone ever heard of Munchausen by proxy? So Munchausen's essentially is where you convince yourself, your mind is convinced that you are sick, okay? And then Munchausen by proxy is you're convinced somebody else is sick. If you wanna watch a really interesting documentary or show, look up Gypsy Rose, the story of Gypsy Rose. 
Basically a gal, her mom had Munchausen by proxy, convinced everyone her daughter had cancer, had like a feeding tube, told her she was allergic to all this stuff. Turns out she was none of those things, ended up having her boyfriend murder her mom. Pretty crazy story. It's, it's a pretty good one, huh? That's like all over social media right now. She yeah, like she just got released. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, why does she look, why does her husband or, yeah, her now husband look the exact same as her mom though? That's my question, weird. Weird, but I digress. But this gal, so this gal had Munchausen, so she had convinced herself she was sick. And so we'd show up, it was not uncommon for her to get intubated. She liked being intubated. She'd had emergency, um, she'd had paramedics intubate her, she's had doctors intubate her. The reason she's so convincing is she has found a way to mimic Strider. She can mimic the sound of Strider in her throat she also, come to find, has the ability to vomit when she wants to vomit. So it's a pretty convincing set. So last time I saw her, we show up. She's, we hear her wheezing strider from across the room. We didn't know who she was at that time. It wasn't my call, my partner's call. I looked at him. I was like, I'm going to ask some questions. You want to get Epi? And he's like, no, I'm going to ask questions. I was like, okay, I'll draw Epi. So I drew up Epi while he's asking, when she gets stung 20 minutes ago at Walmart. Okay, we've got knowing most people die in 30 minutes. we got to get quick on this. Well, what's our dose for Epi again? IM? 0 0.3 milligrams. With IM Epi, this was in CUNA, CUNA to Luke's Meridian. From there to there, she got 1.5 total milligrams of Epi from us, okay? Because she was that convincing. Um, now, the reason I know she was faking was when I talked to the doctor after, I was like, he's like, she's better now. It's like, oh, what'd you do? He's like, I gave her a spritz of Narcan up her nose. She said it made her feel better. It's like, oh, it's like, yeah, she had no opiates in her system. It's like, oh, that checks out, right? So she was faking us. She was playing us the whole time. Um, in fact, the, the night instructor here has actually intubated her at the fair before. That's how like, frequently this has happened with this girl. Um, but with her, we had epi. We had two shots of epi on board in less than 15 minutes, less than 10, because we can redose epi every three to five. Okay, so just have that understanding. It's going to, by the time they call us, their clock has already started. So by the time you get there, you're probably at the 20 minute mark. Okay, you're gonna have to get involved pretty quickly. Okay, so assessment stuff, not a big one. I will say, make sure you are getting a good scene size up. Okay, make sure you're paying attention to your surroundings. And the reason I say that is because some of us have had bad days getting to work. The story I'm gonna go into is the crew before me had an anaphylaxis call the day before, the morning of like 5, 6 a.m. It was summertime, so there's light coming out. When I get there, the first thing my partner asks, or my, the crew I'm leaving asks are, are you allergic to bees? It's like, that's an alarming question. And I said, no, why? He said, well, because there's wasps in the ambulance, because we parked too close to this scene. They just went into the park, they drove into the park, picked her up and went, as wasps were filling into the ambulance when the doors were open. So basically they batted all of them into the cabinets and I had to kill like five or six wasps. Um, it does happen, so pay attention to your surroundings, right? If someone's complaining of bee stings, maybe we try to get them out of that area before we bring ourselves there completely, right? Don't open up your ambulance because had one of those wasps stung her again during transport, resetting our problems, making them worse, right? Uh, and then, yeah, make sure you remove them from the environment, right? So if it's a sting, get the sting out. If there's food, not a lot we can do. Now. You guys, when, if some of you go to Ada County, in your guys' scope now, you can give what is called ODT Zofran. It is an anti-nausea medication, okay? It is in your medic, or excuse me, in the basic scope there. But let's say somebody eats something they're allergic to and they're vomiting. Do you think we should stop giving, or we should stop that vomiting, give them Zofran? No, why not? Right, we want them to vomit. We want them to puke all of this stuff out of their stomach. It's the same thing when we're talking suicide attempts with pills, right? If someone overdoses on a bunch of pills and they're conscious, we want them to puke. We want them to puke all of those pills out, okay? So same idea there. Um, just be quick on ABCs, right? This is gonna be one of those that in your guys' assessments, the order kind of changes, right? If we're talking through your assessment, we have you know the first six, uh, general impression, chief complaint, ABCs, signs, symptoms, then our interventions. This is one that if you get an allergic reaction, you're not quick on epi, you're probably gonna end up running a code and failing the scenario because it wasn't meant to be a code, right? So be quick on your epi administration, even in your assessments. If you're immediately worried about anaphylaxis and you see the signs, airway distress, 
hives on the chest, maybe hives flushing in the face, lips are swelling, just give them epi, okay? 0 0.3 milligrams IM. What is our dose for children? 0 0.15 milligrams, yeah, very good. Yeah, the big one with anaphylaxis is airway, right? We wanna keep that airway open, and if we think about what anaphylaxis is, right? Vasodilation, bronchoconstriction, right? Maybe even some um, decreased contractility. If we look at all the things Epi does, vasodil or vasoconstriction, bronchodilation, increased contractility, it's doing the exact opposite of what anaphylaxis is. Okay, so that's why it works. It's reversing all of the symptoms or the signs and symptoms we're seeing from anaphylaxis. But understand it's temporary, okay? It is not the true fix. They are still dealing with histamine, but we can keep them pretty open with that epi, okay? And then remember, if we can get their airway established to a point where maybe we're, we're not so much worried about their breathing, maybe this is that integumentary GI anaphylaxis, be ready to treat for shock, right? Lay them supine, cover them with a blanket, give them oxygen. Really, when you're treating for shock with an anaphylactic who the airway was involved, you're still gonna give them oxygen, you're still gonna cover them with a blanket. Maybe this time we're at a semi fowler though, right? Because we want gravity to kind of help us with their lung situation. We don't wanna make their breathing harder than we have to. Uh, how do you think you're gonna be driving with an anaphylactic patient? Fast. Yeah, fast, yeah, pretty fast. Yep, um, history, this is where history is gonna be an important thing, right? Part of sample is allergies. So when we're asking for allergies, ask for everything across the board. I see a lot of people make the mistake of asking, oh, what medications are you allergic to? People are allergic to more than meds, okay? And if you're that specific, paramedics and EMTs are very good at guiding our patients into saying what we're saying, kind of what we want them to say, right? But we want them to give an honest answer, okay? So just ask, any allergies in general? It's gonna open things up, right? Oh, I'm allergic to shellfish, I'm allergic to nuts, tree nuts, whatever, okay? Um, but that history is gonna be very important, especially in anaphylaxis, because if we know they're allergic to something and they got into it, they're probably having anaphylactic reactions, okay? To the point this is where also part of the history outside of our sample, this is where coming and asking those questions like, any changes in detergent? Have you been intubated for this before? Have you been to the ICU for this before, right? These are when we can start including those questions. So sometimes, not sometimes rather, I want you guys to start developing that ability, right? Start asking questions that are a little bit outside the box. Even if it doesn't make total sense to your proctor while you're asking it, ask away, okay? There's nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with trying to get more information. I've had medics tell me if you're not asking questions a whole call, you're not doing a good job. Okay, um, on this one, if possible, have any of the interventions already been completed? That one is good to know, especially if you're picking them up from a clinic, right? Show up, have you done anything? Yeah, we just gave her epi a minute ago. Well, we don't wanna give her another dose until a few minutes down the road, right? Or if we know, have you given her anything? Yeah, we gave her epi and 50 of Benadryl. Okay, we might have some time. They've administered the medication they need. We just gotta kinda get them to the hospital at this point. And then ask about severe allergic reactions in the past, like I said. Uh, uh, uh. Physical exam, big one. I really, really wanna emphasize, lift the shirt, look at the chest, look at the stomach. Okay, even in your guys' scenarios, I'm gonna have a mannequin. Well, I won't have a mannequin in there for medical. If you get an allergic reaction medical, I really encourage you guys to, I'm gonna lift up the patient's shirt. Do I see anything, right? Obviously make it make sense to the call. Don't just do that on everybody. But um, it is something worth noting because if you don't look at the skin, you're missing a lot of stuff, right? If you show up and you just see the airway involved, we do not know that's anaphylaxis until we can confirm another uh, system involved, okay? Okay, so vital signs, nothing really big there, right? Just get all your vitals. This, is, this will be one though. Start looking for airway patency. Are we worried about that airway shutting? How hard are they breathing, right? Because if they're breathing and working really hard, they're gonna get tired and eventually fail, okay? And then listen for lung sounds. What lung sound do we expect to hear for anaphylaxis? Wheezing, wheezing. What did you say? Say it again. And possibly strider. Strider, well yeah, possibly strider, but remember lung sound versus airway, right? Tricked ya, you've been duped. 
So every five, every 15 as needed. Um, these are also gonna be ones when you guys are talking about your radio reports, these are gonna be the ones that you probably are gonna be doing more interventions for, right? Like if you have a 25, 30 minute drive, we can redose epi, epi every three to five minutes, okay? They're gonna tell, they're gonna ask how many epis you give them. Oh, I give them three, give them four, give them five, right? So when you're giving a report, you know, in route with XYZ, code three, emergent, um, interventions done, four epis, and they're currently on a non-rebreather, right? We can say that, but make sure you're including how much they get because the hospital is gonna wanna stay in the loop with that. And then document everything as always. Okay, so our care. If a patient appears to be having a severe anaphylactic reaction, BLS, right? Not really that crazy. Get them epi, get them oxygen. Okay, be prepared for potential cardiac arrest. So if stinger's present, scrape skin, edge of a sharp, stiff object, such as credit card, we do not use tweezers or forceps. We do not wanna squeeze that venom further into the skin. If you have the ability, wash the area with soap or antiseptic. Um, remove any jewelry in the area. Position the injection site below the heart and apply ice or cold packs. So let's talk through these a little bit. Realism, if you're in someone's house and you've got soap and water, yeah, you should use it if you've got that available option, okay? Um, now, we don't typically have that option. So big one is going to be, especially removing that jewelry, right? If they get stung in the hand by a bee and they're allergic and they're wearing rings or a bracelet or a watch, they're gonna swell around that and we are not gonna be able to get it back off, okay? We do have a ring and jewelry cutter in the ambulance. Just know if you cut an old woman's jewelry, she, you just made an enemy for life. Okay, she's gonna hate you, I promise, okay? Um, and this can be pretty intense. Uh, one of my roommates in college, his dad came down, we were, I was helping him like, his grandparents had passed away, so we were helping go through their house. And his dad got into some bees when we were gone, showed up the next day and his arms looked like Popeye, just giant. And he's like, yeah, I got into a couple bees yesterday. He's like, a couple? You should go to a doctor, dude. Um, but imagine if he'd been wearing a watch or rings, right? All of that swelling around there. Why do you think we position the injection site below the heart? Any guesses? Wait, what's that again? Opposite, makes it a little harder, right? Not so much harder, but think about gravity. If I got stung in the hand and I put my hand up here, where's my blood going? Immediately straight down, right? Gravity is assisting that. If I got stung in the hand and I'm below the heart, gravity is still keeping some of that venom down here. We're still gonna circulate. But it, the idea is that we can keep less of it from circulating if we keep it below gravity or below the heart, okay? Circulation's harder for stuff that's below the heart. And then why do you think we can apply cold packs? What does cold do to our vasculature? It constricts. What is a problem with anaphylaxis with our vasculature? Dilation. So if we put ice packs on there, we can vasoconstrict some of that down and maybe slow that circulation a bit, okay? Uh, be alert for signs of airway swelling and other signs, right? Nausea, vomiting, hives. Put them supine, give them oxygen. That's one I would kind of tamper with, right? If they're really anaphylactic with breathing issues, laying them supine is going to be really hard for them, okay? Because gravity is pulling on them too. So maybe just slightly elevate the head, close to a semi fowler, okay? But oxygen, blankets, and monitor the vital signs. And remember epi, 0 0.3 milligrams. It is a sympathomimetic, which means it's a mimic, right? It mimics the sympathetic response. And the reason it works is because the sympathetic response directly is the uh, adverse effects of anaphylaxis. Okay, so it causes blood vessel constriction, reverses vasodilation and hypotension, increases cardiac contractility, relieves bronchospasm, and then rapidly reverses the effects of anaphylaxis. So for me, just a little bit of a personal story, what made me want to become a paramedic was actually seeing a call, an uh, anaphylaxis call. Guy was allergic to tuna, ate a tuna pouch, crazy, had a reaction. Uh, I watched this guy go from a balloon to epi and Benadryl in 20 minutes was normal. It was like magic, blew my mind, okay? It's pretty cool when you see these things work. So just keep that in mind as well. So epi prescribed by a physician comes pre-dosed in an epi pen. So that epi pen is a metered dosed injector. OK, 
Okay, so your EMS service may or may not allow you to assist the patient in administration of Epi. So for you guys with EpiPens, if they have an EpiPen, you can assist them with it. You'll see old, old protocols saying medical control to assist them with their EpiPen. You don't have to, okay? Now also in that same front, it has been added to your scope to draw up and administer your own epinephrine, okay? So uh, if you see an EpiPen, you got a couple of choices. For me, if they're severe enough where I need Epi right now, I'm gonna use their EpiPen. Now, I show up, I have their, they look like they're, they're virgin, maybe I draw up our own, okay? Only reason I would say we draw up our own is because these are expensive, okay? And so if I can be a patient advocate in one perspective or another, I'm going to be, okay? That said, I'm not going to let my beliefs get in the way of their healthcare, right? If they really need Epi, just give them the Epi. That's the whole reason they have it. Okay, but if we have the time, we can draw up our own, let's draw up our own. And then refer to local protocols or consult medical control. It is in your protocols for epi. So epi pens, lateral aspect of the thigh, okay? How long should we hold epi pens in? I heard three seconds. I've also heard 10 seconds. So welcome to being in medicine where you're gonna have overseeing bodies who have slightly different viewpoints. Some say three, some say 10. I shot for five. Shoot for the middle, right? Good enough. Lateral aspect though. Uh, now side effects of epi, right? Remember it is a sympathomimetic, so you're gonna have that sympathetic response. High blood pressure because their pulse rate's going up, right? Anxiety, as our heart starts beating a lot faster, people get anxious, right? When you feel those palpitations. If they have poor cardiac health, they can go into weird rhythms as well. You can throw them into a cardiac arrhythmia. They might get pale, dizzy, might have chest pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, all potential side effects of epi, but all of those are side effects you gotta be alive to experience, right? So end of the day, you're still gonna give them their epi. We do not give epi to patients without signs of respiratory compromise or hypotension. Okay, and then those who do not meet criteria for a diagnosis of anaphylaxis. You guys need to start learning what meds we use for what situations. If we cannot or we are not in that situation, we do not use that med. Okay, for you guys, epi is solely for anaphylaxis. Okay, now when you get out there, you'll see epi used in a variety of manners. We use it in codes, we use it for breathers, but for you guys, anaphylaxis is your scope. Mm -hmm.